the extraordinary thing here is that uh, uh, there have been very few national security issues that have gotten into things like tra uh, trade issues, uh, that uh, we have declared that these tariffs uh, will apply to uh, uh, across the board to all those who supply us with steel, and that includes our, our, our strong allies. And uh, even the Defense Department said, wait a minute, you know, uh, we only take about 3% of the steel that comes in, and uh, the, you are putting t tariffs on Europe, Germany, um, Japan, uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, North, uh, Korea, and, uh, you know, the hostility is going to create more national security concerns. So after announcing the tariffs, the president uh, granted temporary exemptions for Europe, Argentina, Brazil, and uh, Australia. And uh, it, he said that they would be temporary only if those countries would confront China, because China was the problem. And with respect to Mexico and Canada, the two largest exporters to us of steel, he said, it'll depend on how you negotiate the North American Free Trade Agreement. And so there's a lot of uncertainty out there. In terms of what's been missing, I would say that you know, the goal of trade policy shouldn't be just to trade more, to have things that we call free trade, but we need to balance a lot of domestic interests. And I've represented working families for about 20 years at the AFL-CIO. And so finding the balance between the interests of multinational corporations and everybody else is, I think, should be the goal of our trade policy. And I think we've failed at that through both Democratic and Republican administrations, that the interests of multinational corporations around profit, around flexibility, mobility, outsourcing, um, less taxes, cheaper labor, and less regulation are the set of concerns that I would say have dominated our negotiators' uh, agenda. On the other hand, everybody else, you know, workers and family farmers and domestic producers, small businesses, need to live here in the United States. We need good jobs here in the United States. We need to make sure that we have a good balance between our democratic decision-making processes and you know, the interests of corporations to be less regulated. We also have failed to invest in our future in the way that we needed to do, investing in infrastructure and in skills and in workforce development. And that's left the United States in a uniquely disadvantaged position. But I wanted to say that, um, so if you think about trade policy, that it has been too geared towards outsourcing and the interests of corporations that want to produce in other countries versus the interests of exporters, which would create better jobs, would achieve more reciprocity in terms of the trade balance, that that's the, the, the outcome we'd look for. And this brand of globalization, the particular kinds of trade policies we've put in place, have contributed to the wage stagnation and the growing wage inequality, and that's why we have so much political unrest. You know, how are our allies viewing the changing policies here in the US? <laughs> I think Carla got the word exactly right earlier, which is uncertainty. And it's, I think when we talk to the business community across the world, it's very difficult for people to understand right now where the administration is heading. So what's the end point vis-a-vis -vis the WTO, vis-a-vis -vis China, and vis-a-vis -vis other trading partners? And I think the, the uncertainty is captured very neatly by the WTO, the World Trade Organization's latest projections for trade growth in 2008. 18. Currently, they're estimating growth of around 4%, which by post-financial crisis standards isn't that bad. It's pretty respectable. But if you look, that projection comes with a huge caveat. So what they're saying is policy uncertainty and business decision-making around that uncertainty could drag trade growth down to 3% or even 2.5%. So you see it's out there. What I think is particularly interesting though. I think the, the uncertainty is a pretty obvious statement. Everyone knows that. What I think is interesting to look at though is how the business community is responding. And I think you can characterize the, uh, the Trump administration's approach to trade policy as almost every man for themselves. You know, we're moving away from strategic alliances, we're moving away from the multilateral system, and we're picking countries off one by one. And I think almost the business community globally is falling into that paradigm. So we see businesses in India certainly very interested and upset by US policy when uh, 
the administration puts in place a review of the generalized system of preferences. We see countries, uh, businesses in countries such as Indonesia doing the same. But there's no one out there, I think, taking a strategic view, making a strategic case for multilateralism or plurilateral coalitions. And there's no one in countries such as India or Indonesia actually reflecting on some of the deficiencies in the trade policies of those countries that need to be amended. The cry we hear is, the US is now protectionist while we're opening up. Washington people brag about the fact that they produce an agreement after 10, 12 years of working on it. And what I suggested to them, and I asked them, how many of those farmers, how many of those businesses do you think are still in business 12 years later? You know, if you're Boeing, you can stand an eight-year trade dispute with, with um, Airbus over something. If you're one of the 90% of small businesses in America who export, you need resolution of these issues right away. And so one of the things I at least tried to bring to the perspective of the job was resolving disputes quicker. Because as a mayor, I have a bias. We don't use, I mean, we're capable of, but we don't speak in terms of macroeconomics. We talk about jobs. We talk about jobs, and we talk about jobs. And for those of us who believe in trade, as many of us do on this table, and I'm thrilled that, that Thea's here for that reason, and we had a lot of Dalton work together um, as U.S. trade rep, we have to understand that anxiety among the American middle class over that one issue. And if we can give them an argument that a smart trade policy that gives us access to other markets as freely as we've given them to ours, that we hold everybody accountable, we all play by a certain set of rules, then you begin to get Americans um, to think differently about trade. Jobs is the big debate when it comes to trade. You know, I think over the last few decades, the public narrative appears to have shifted decidedly more negative. In this past election, we had both major candidates but from both parties campaigning negatively on trade. What, Carla, what haven't we been doing right as a proponent of, of, of as part of NAFTA and a proponent of, of freer trade, what haven't we been doing right domestically to whether it's help people or explain to them the benefits of trade? What, what are we missing? I think two things. One is informing the American public of the benefits of trade. For 70 years, whether we were under Republican or Democratic administration, we believed in opening our markets. And what the economic uh, reports show, Peterson Institute for International Economics, that our GDP has climbed by $2.2 trillion. And that's something that really has filtered down to American families. It's a plus. But what we haven't been doing is informing Americans about this. And the second thing is I agree that we have been woefully deficient in training our workers who have been dislodged from their jobs. They've been told it's trade, but trade is a small percentage of reality. The big thing that takes jobs is technology. I mean, you didn't have a cell phone. 10 or 15 years ago, and there's so many things that have changed in our economy. And uh, what we need to do is to train our workers to handle the jobs for the 21st century, not look back. I think the problems, you know, it starts with um, you know, the displacement and the impact on wages, which is more than just the job impact. And so one thing, you know, Carla, you talk about the growth in GDP and how much is there, that has not been distributed to average working people. And trade is one piece of the problem, and technology is another piece. They're actually connected to each other. They're intertwined. It's, economists are not, have not been able to really separate the impact of trade and technology. Because if you think about it, like if you're an exporter, uh, and you, know, you might be under pressure to get prices down, and you might Im put in place new technology. And so those things are connected to each other. But, so when we talk about progressive internationalism, it's not just about you know, paying off the losers. It is also about having a different set of trade rules. And what are the principles that ought to guide the rules around trade? And I would say there, you know, we have to understand that trade policy has failed working people in this country and around the world. And if we don't accept that, if it's not just a question of educating people better or telling them that their job is, is dependent on trade, 
but the growth in GDP has been maldistributed. Most, the typical worker for the last 30 years has not seen a, a, a pay increase. The, for the Obama administration, we fiercely tried to reject the false narrative that if you're for trade, you care nothing about workers. Right. If you're against trade, you, you know, stick your head in the sand and don't understand globalism. And I was blessed uh, to be appointed uh, trade rep by a president who understood both of those. And he, and we always talked about the fact that if you lived in Maine, if you lived in Carolina, if you lived in Detroit where my in-laws do, you'd be pretty upset about this too. But I got to balance it by the reality that Carla, I became the mayor of Dallas six months after NAFTA went into effect. And I got to see how trade can work to create jobs. So rather than saying one or the other, we have to be more honest about the fact if we just talk about job training, to me, that, that's dealing with the, the, the pipe after it's burst. We need to look at our whole educational infrastructure, and we need a more honest conversation about why jobs are disappearing. Because if we buy into the narrative, every factory closed is because of trade, we're never going to win that argument. Ron mentioned the same old debate about trade. I don't think this is the same old debate about trade anymore. I think we've gone into a different dimension. And so I've worked in public affairs for 15 plus years. My parents have absolutely no idea what I do. If you ask my dad, what does Andrew do? He will say he works in New York. That's the, that's the best explanation you can give. We've had, two, New York. we've had two conversations about trade policy in 15 years. The first, I remember, was in 1999 when there were uh, riots on the streets of Seattle at the margins of the World Trade Organization's mm -hmm. ministerial. I remember my dad saying, these people are crazy, they need to get a job, they don't know what they're doing, they're idiots, fine. Fast forward 15 years maybe, and I remember walking down the street in London one day, and my dad calls me in a complete panic, and he says, have you heard of something called TTIP? It's this proposed trade deal between the European Union and the US. And you know what, I'm really worried about it. He had no idea that I might have been working on <laughs> TTIP in London. But he was really worried about it. And he took me through all of his concerns. And all of the concerns were essentially taken from a number of respectable newspaper articles he'd read that morning. And those articles were sourced from social media campaigning. And it was the kind of hysterical dialogue on trade, which I think does us no favors in terms of plotting something that is more inclusive in terms of the future of trade policy making. But what I see is something that's gone from the extreme into the mainstream, thanks to social media and perhaps the hollowing out of the mainstream media. And I think that puts us in a very different space. And I think those of us that believe in free markets, not necessarily people who think that free markets are perfect and an objective in themselves, but people who think that the market can bring benefits, that it can create jobs, that it can give choice to consumers, have really lost the debate completely in this new space, in the new media space and on social media. And I think it comes down very clearly to two things. The first is a battle between information and communication. Those who believe in trade provide information. We're really good. The OECD is fantastic at providing studies on the benefits of open markets. But those studies are sort of 100 pages and will send anyone who's not a trade policy wonk to sleep in two seconds. Whereas the people like President Trump communicate. They have a very clear message. So in the, in the online world, I'm afraid, communication always beats information. And the second thing is, you see even people who can communicate on trade policy, they use facts. They talk about the growth in jobs, 3%, growth in the economy, whatever else. It turns people off. We know, and, and every single study that has looked at this in terms of Twitter or Facebook or anything else, what matters on social media is emotion. Emotion beats fact each and every time. And again, those of us who believe in at least a nuanced debate in trade, I think are losing that dynamic, and I think we're losing the debate. And we need to find a way to recast this, because otherwise those people who feel uncertain, I think will continue to buy into the idea of decoupling from regional integration, or decoupling from the global economy. And I think that puts us in a dangerous place politically.